Well, good morning, Coastal Community Church. How are you guys doing today? You guys doing good? Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is TJ. I'm one of the pastors here. We're so glad you're joining us this morning for week two of a series we're calling Faith in the Fire. Can you guys help me by welcoming everybody that's watching online and everybody at our Lighthouse Point location? Man, we're so glad. You guys are joining with us this weekend. We love you, and uh, man, we're excited to be with you. And uh, I, I, I'm pumped about this. Uh, God's been doing incredible things in the services, so I, I hope he does it in this service. Uh, um, and if he doesn't, then you should have gone to a different service. So just, I'm uh, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, this series was really uh, birthed out of a season of, of where I felt like I, I, it seemed like everywhere I turned, I was going through a test in my life. Anybody ever had a season like that where it's like, it's like, man, I'm seriously, another test, another test, another test. It was like, man, and, and I know if you've ever had a season like that, it feels like you're getting tested in your patience. It feels like you're getting tested in your marriage. It feels like you're getting tested at your job. It feels like everywhere you turn, it's like one test after another test after another test. And, and I think that we've all gone through it. And it was during that season I was reading in my one-year Bible and I came across a story that really gave me a lot of encouragement. It gave me a lot of wisdom of how to overcome the tests of life. And it's really a study about these three boys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, in the Bible that where God has this incredible purpose for them. He has something important for them to do. And let me just tell you, because if you are chosen by God to do something important in life, you need to know that there is gonna be a testing that comes with that. Like so many people have this idea that like, man, if God has something great for me, then it must be that I'm gonna go do that thing and it's gonna be simple and it's gonna be easy. There's gonna be no difficult. It's gonna basically be rainbows and butterflies. It's, it's just gonna be awesome. And the reality is, is that if you're ever gonna do anything great for God, there's gonna be some difficulty that comes along with it. Like all throughout scripture, there's people that are called by God to do incredible things. And what you see is they went through fire, they went through hell, they went through difficulty. They went through struggles in life. And so I want you to know if you feel like you're in a season of testing, you're in a season of struggles, what that means is on the other side of it, God's got something great for you. That should be some encouragement for some people here today. And so our guys, they, they experience a test and we talked about it last week. They immediately, as they're taken into captivity, they experience what I call the character test. And I think it's a test that every single one of us have to pass in life. And if you missed last week, I would encourage you to go back online and watch it because it's important because we talk about a phenomena that I think is happening in our culture today. And it's this phenomena where everybody wants Every, everybody wants to have a big reputation. Like Taylor Swift said it, right? I've got a big reputation, big reputation. Ooh, got a big reputation. Okay, you guys don't listen to Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift and, and Justin Bieber, you all are failing in the music life. Okay, I'm just letting you know. But everybody wants a big reputation. The problem with that is, is, is that's an exterior thing and nobody's focusing on the interior thing that actually builds your reputation and it's your character. And, if, and I've just learned in my life that if I'll build my character, then God will take care of my reputation. Right. That's a word for somebody that's out there today that's so worried about their Instagram profile. No, no, no. You need to worry about the profile that's happening inside of you. And so today we're continuing this series on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, starting in Daniel chapter 3. If, if you want to follow along or you can look in your worship God, it says this, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high in six cubits wide. Now, if you don't know what that translates to, it's basically, he makes this image of gold that is 90 foot tall and nine foot thick. How many of y'all know that that's, that's pretty big? Like, I, I would say that that's pretty big. And it says, it set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So, so what's happening is, is, is Nebuchadnezzar is setting up this, this monument of sorts. It's a way of him celebrating his, his domination over the Israelites and taking that nation captive. In fact, scholars believe that when he began to build this, this uh, thing, erect this 90 foot by nine foot thi thick uh, monument that it was something for them to celebrate. It was a way for them to look back and remember, like it was never intended to actually be an idol. And, and I think this is important. Now, let me just get your attention here today, church, because this is what happens to us 
in our world today. There are a lot of things that you never intended to be an idol in your life. They started off as beautiful. They started off as awesome. It might've been that child that you birthed. It might've been that business that you started. It may have been that gift that you were given and you cultivated it and it turned into something beautiful. And before long, it went from just being a really, really nice thing or a really good thing or a really awesome thing to being the very thing that you focus your entire life on. And I think we have to be very, very careful what we are letting ourselves worship yeah. Yeah. in life. Because there are a lot of things, if we aren't careful, we will unintentionally worship the, the thing that the creator made instead of the creator of the thing. Yeah. And we'll miss out on the thing that God has wanted in our life. We'll elevate something that's beautiful and that's awesome and that's a gift above the place where God deserves in our lives. And so what's happening in this story is, is as this, uh, this monument is being built, some of the leaders of that country come to King Nebuchadnezzar and they say, hey, listen, we think you, that everybody should worship this. And they come up with a plan. And this is what it says in verse five. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, anybody know what a zither is? Nobody, okay. If anybody ever learns how to play the zither, I want you on the worship team, okay? I'm just telling you. I don't know what it is, but it just sounds awesome. I want one of them up here. The lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music. You must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. So they're basically, we, we want you to worship. And listen, if you don't worship, here's what's gonna happen. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a finery furnace. How many of y'all know that that escalated pretty quickly? It's like, it's like you couldn't have like slapped me on the wrist. You couldn't have given me a fine. Couldn't have put me in the jail. No, no, no. If you don't worship, you're being thrown in a fiery furnace. It's, it's, here's the reality. It's bow or burn. And you go, man, this is a, this is a pretty intense decision these people had made. But the reality is, is TJ, this would never happen in our culture today. Really? Are you sure about that? Like, because like, I look around and I see people making equally stupid decisions today where they tell everybody to bow down to this idea. They tell everybody to bow down to this ideology. They tell you to bow down to this or to that. And the whole world just goes, okay. Like they just buy in hook, line, and sinker. And look at what happens to the people that try to stand. They get, they get burned. Like that would never happen today. No, no, no. We don't burn people any now. An we just cancel them. Yeah. Come on, it's 2022. Yeah. Yeah. It's what we do. It's just a, this isn't just an Old Testament story. This is a story for 2022. Yeah. This is a story for every single one of our lives. But some people said, you know what, I, I'm not going to do what everybody else is doing. There's actually a remnant of people that, that said, you know what, I'm not going to stand. And that's what's happening here in the story. And some people go to the king in verse 12 and they say this. But there are some Jews whom you've had set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you set up. They say, not only are they not listening to you, but they're not bowing down. And so this idol that has been cre created, they said, here's the deal. When this idol is up, when people hear the music, here's what everybody has to do. Everybody has to bow. And so what happens is the music plays. Everybody starts bowing. And there's three young Hebrew boys that are standing in the midst of everyone else. And I think that they make a decision that every one of us needs to make today, especially in the face of adversity, in the face of everybody doing what everybody else is doing. They make it a decision to stand. And what we need today for our lives is we need the faith to actually stand up in life. We need the faith to stand up in our life in a world that is constantly bowing down. I think it's time for the church to stand back up. Listen, the crowd was bowing. Let me say it this way. Uh, they were choosing to live a life lower than God ever wanted them to live. And when the crowd went low, 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bow down when I know what is right. I'm not going to succumb to the pressure of this life, even in the frustration, even with the consequences that are out there, even when everybody else is doing the thing, I'm going to choose to stand. And I think the call for us when we're in a period of testing today is to stand. The easy thing would be to go low and to give in and to bow down. But, but God is challenging the church. God is challenging you and I to stand up today. Not only to the temptation of the culture around us, but also the Bible says that it, it was to like the boss that was there. Daniel chapter three, starting in verse 13. It says, Nebuchadnezzar was furious with rage. I don't know about y'all, but have you ever had a boss that like texted you a mean text and was like, I'm ticked. Come on, raise your hands. Ever had a boss that was mad at you? Like when you get that text, I don't know about you, but every time I got a text from my boss and I knew they were mad, I was like, ooh, do you think it's as serious as I think it is? Like, I think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they probably got together and they said, you know, do you think it's really that big a deal? I know everybody else, when the music played, they bowed down and we were like the only three people standing. But do you really think it's that big of a deal? Like, I think it's pretty obvious where we stood. It says, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true? Like, are the rumors out there true? Like, it could be said like this, is it true that you're still standing for your marriage when it's in, the, in, it's in the pits right now? Like, is it true that you're still believing God for the breakthrough and that addiction in your life? Like, like, is it true that you're still standing firm in your faith today? Like, is it actually happening? Are you really standing like that? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I've set up. Like, is it really true, guys? Like they're standing in front of the most important person on the planet right there and then. And they made a decision while everyone else was willing to bow in the midst of confrontation. They said, you know what? We're going to choose to stand. And this is important for us to understand because like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hebrew scholars believe these are three young Hebrew boys. They're 14, 15, 16, 17 years old. They're, they're students in our day and age. Like, and, and nowhere in the Jewish tradition was there like a class on how do you stand up to a foreign empire that builds a 90 foot by nine foot statue that asks you to worship it. Like there wasn't a class on, there wasn't a next steps that they took. Like I'm gonna take four steps to know how to stand up to king. There wasn't a connect group that they could go to to learn all this. So what was it about them that made they, them stand? What was it about these three boys' lives? And I think it's this, is that they made a decision to predetermine whose they were, who they were, and what they believed in life. And they said, no matter what the world throws at us, no matter how the world changes, we're gonna stand for what is right. Now, this is a big deal because the world is filled with a lot of changes, isn't it? Like, let's be honest, life changes a lot, doesn't it? Like, I, I'm not the same person I was growing up. Like, I'm definitely not the same person I was in college, thank goodness. Like, I think about if social media was out when I was in college, like, I would have never gotten a job because I would have been the idiot that would have done all the dumb stuff. Like, when I was, when I was in college, here's what I did. I, I stayed up as late as I could. I, I, I would play loud music, and I would play video games all night. Now, today, because life has changed, I'm like, can I go to bed at 7.30? Come on, somebody. <laughs> Like, I'm like, can we turn the music down and shake in the inside of me? And like, I think people, guys that play video games are losers and single. Life changes. Friends change. Like, I remember in high school, girls, it's always the girls that do this. They'd find that girl that was their girl. And they'd go and they'd buy the heart necklace with BFF on it. <laughs> best friends forever. You're going to be my best friend forever. And they would they'd split it up in one half and one half. We're so close. 20 years later, they haven't talked. Why? Because friends change. Listen, you change. You used to have a hairline and now you're bald. 
and beautiful. It's okay. <laughs> Things change. I, I, I love what the great philosopher Heraclitus said. He said, change is the only constant in life. It's the only constant in life. And, and haven't you seen that to be true in your life? And here's the deal. If we aren't careful, like life will throw us some curveballs. And if you haven't predecided, like what you believe, what will end up happening in the midst of those curveballs is you'll end up having a crisis of faith. Like, I love this moment where this life throws these three Hebrew boys like a curveball, and they go, we didn't decide right now in the moment who we are and whose we are and what we believe. No, no, no. We pre-decided that we're not going to let life's changes determine the decisions that we're going to make. We're going to go by what God says in spite of what life says, and we're going to trust his way because we know that God wants what's best for our life. And so life changes, culture changes. Can we all agree that culture changes? Like, and it changes fast. There are things that, that are okay now that didn't used to be okay. Like, there are some things that you, you can't say now that we used to say all the time. Like, I get in trouble for that kind of stuff all the time. I'll say something and, and like some of our staff will be like, you can't say that today. I'm like, why? I grew up saying that. Why? Because culture has changed. And some of the changes, honestly, they're great. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm so thankful for some of the changes that have taken. Like, I'm thankful that we don't deal with Jinko jeans anymore. Come on, somebody. If you're a product of the late 90s, this was all the rage. You, you probably went to concerts that were like, <laughs> as well, but that's okay. That, that was a form of music back in my high school days that I did not partake in. But this was the dumbest trend I ever saw in my life. I'm so thankful the culture changes and we're not wearing jeans with bottoms that are bigger than our heads. Okay. Uh, I, I'm thankful that kids don't play with toys like this anymore. That You guys remember Furby? It's the most demonic toy on the planet. You look at those eyes. I guarantee there's a camera in there and a microphone. China is watching us. I, I, I'm really thankful that, that, that men don't wear these anymore. Some overalls. <laughs> Listen, no guy should ever wear overalls. We just need to say, bye, bye, bye. <laughs> bye, bye. You know, like we just need to take overalls away. And listen, you can, okay, there's one exception. You can wear overalls if you're a farmer, okay? If you're a farmer, it's okay. Otherwise, like I, I'm thankful that culture has changed. In fact, there's some changes in culture that I'm really thankful. I'm thankful for communication. I'm thankful for technology. Yeah. I'm thankful for those changes in life, but we gotta be careful that we don't bow down to every cultural change that they say that we need to bow down to them. Be careful that we just don't mindlessly do what everybody else is doing. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I would tell you, if everybody else is doing it, it's probably wrong. It just is. Like we have to remember that we're called to be the church because we're called to go into the world but not necessarily be of this world. And I'm concerned at times that we're losing our ability to impact because we look more like the world than different from them. And here's an important question for us to ask ourselves is, is will I change the world or will the world change me? Like, as you look at your life, are you changing the world around you or is the world around you changing you? Like, it's an introspective question because I think a lot of us, we're bowing way too many times to things that God has never called us to bow to. And see, here's what I know. Life changes and culture changes, but here's the good news. God never changes. God never changes changes. He never changes based off what life has to say. He never changes based on the diagnosis that you got. He never changes based on what your children are doing or what your struggle is. No, no, no. God is constant. He is, the Bible says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so God never changes, and that's good news because when life changes and culture changes, this, there's something you can actually stand on. You can actually stand on the truth of God's word. 
It is the one constant in your life. It is the foundation of your life. When everyone else is building their life on sinking sand, there is a foundation that you can build your life on that will stand firm, that will allow you to stand up in the midst when everybody is sinking and bowing down. Because he's good, he's loving, and he is for you. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had a crucial decision to make. When everything was changing, the decision was, I'm going to stick with God. I'm going to stick with God. And I think there's a decision that we have to make as individuals and as a church. When everything else in this world might change, what are we going to choose to stand on? Or are we going to choose to bow with everybody else? Are we going to choose to say, you know what? I'm going to stand with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 says this, be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Like, don't let everything in this world sway you. He says, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. And why does he say all that? Because it takes some strength to stand. Yeah. It takes some courage to stand in life when everybody else is bowing down. And here's what I've realized. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything. Yeah. And here's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that so many of us were falling for the latest and the greatest and the newest and the coolest thing. And we're falling for anything because we haven't made up our mind. What do I stand for? Like, what do you stand for? I'm just determined in my life that I'm going to know what I stand for in spite of what the world throws my way, in spite of what culture tells me and what everything else. I want to be a difference maker in this world. And while the whole world is bowing to something that's stupid, I'm going to stand up because I'm not going to fall for anything because I stand for something. So I think God is challenging us. He's challenging you. And he's asking you, what do you stand for? And I think I, there are three things that we should stand for today that I think are pretty important that if we want to be the Shadrach, Meshachs, and Abednegoes of our day, when the pressure on is on, here's what I want you to stand for. Number one, when others bow, I will stand up for my purpose. Because we've all had moments in life where we get around people and they're frustrated. They're discouraged. Anybody been around a frustrated person? Anybody encountered a discouraged person? I know that we have translation coming on, but I need you to raise your hands. Come on. Anybody ever been frustrated with somebody else? Come on, raise your hands. Anybody ever been frustrated? Okay, some of y'all have never been frustrated with people. I, gotta, I wanna know what the secret is. Oh, you're a bunch of liars. Okay, that's a secret. Oh, got you. Okay, cool. And, and, and when you're around those people, you, you try to give them solutions and they're like, I tried this and it didn't work. Man, like, like I went to church once and it, 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 didn't, it didn't connect with me. Uh, you, you said get in a group. I went one time and I didn't meet my best friend. Well, how do you know you were there for 13 minutes? <laughs> and, and they're like, well, this, what I'm doing isn't working. And when others choose to bow, you have a decision to make. I'm going to stand up for my purpose. And here's what I know is like I realize they may have settled. I realize they have, made, have given in because of the frustration in life. And, and I'm just pre predetermined that even though I may serve and get nothing out of it, I may give and get nothing out of it, I'm just predetermined that I'm gonna stand for my purpose because God was not wrong about me. God did not call me to this place to let me down. And God did not call you to that place to let you down either. He's called us to stand. That's why I believe I refuse to settle for anything less than God's best for my life. And I'm gonna live in such a way that others around me may have bowed. They may have bowed to the American dream. They may have bowed to some political persuasion. They may have bowed to being a nominal Sunday morning Christian. But no, not me. I'm choosing to be a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No matter what is discouraging, no matter what is frustrating, I'm gonna stand for purpose. Because God has called me and he is for me. And if God is for me, who can be against me? And if God is for you, who can be against you? You're more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Stop letting the world conquer you and start taking some ground and stomp on this world and tell them, no, I'm going to stand. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Don't let the haters move you. 
Don't let the frustration move you. Don't let the difficulty move you. It says always give yourself fully. See, this is a problem. We give ourselves like three inches and we're like, oh man, I kind of went in and it didn't work. No, 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 because you can't go part way in. You got to go all the way in. Like nobody, nobody like kind of like, oh, I, I'm trying to stand, but I'm just, no, 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 stand up. Go fully into the work of the Lord because you know that, listen, when we stand up, it's not in vain. Like God's going to use that in your life. You need to stand for purpose. God has called you. Number two, when others bow, I'm going to stand up for my community. Because we've all been in situations where the community that you're planted in in life is being attacked. It might be about your spouse. It might be about your boss. It might be about your coworker. It might be about your church. And what happens when you join in that kind of talk and those kind of conversations with people, you're bowing to gossip. You're bowing to slander. You're, you're bowing to like, oh, guess what I heard? Or in my opinion, listen, opinions are like buttholes. Everybody's got one and they all stink. That's a word from the Lord for somebody right there. And when you start throwing all those things out there, what you end up with a, is, is a whole bunch of disunity and you end up with a whole bunch of division. And so when that conversation starts coming around you, when everybody is giving in and bowing to that kind of talk, when others are bowing, here's what you do. You stand up for your community. Listen, you can talk about a lot of things in life. Like, you can talk bad about my sports team. It's okay. But don't you dare talk about my bride. Don't you dare say something around me about Shayla. I will punch you in the throat. Why? Because I, I, I'm a stand for my, that's my community. Like, don't ever get around me and talk bad about my church. In fact, don't ever get around me and talk bad about a church. Why? Because that's Jesus' broad. And if I'm willing to punch somebody in the throat for my broad, you better believe I'll punch you in the face for his broad. You're like, this pastor is kind of violent. Well, yeah. <laughs> I am because I'm sick and tired of people laying down to everything yeah. and standing for nothing. Yeah. And there are some things that we need to stand for in life. Like, like guard the community that God has placed you in. In your workplace, when everybody is at the water cooler gossiping and you walk up on that conversation, you go, no, we're, I'm, not, I'm not doing this. Listen, we need each other. Like, we're better together. When you're on that phone call with your mom and, and she's like, oh, have you heard about Uncle Eddie? You go, mom, I'm not talking about Uncle Eddie. Like, instead of talking bad about Eddie, why don't we go reconcile with Eddie so when Thanksgiving comes, it's not awkward because we're better together. Like, we're stuck with him anyways. We might as well be in good relationship. Ecclesiastes says it like this. Two are better than one. Because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity the fool, as Mr. T would say. Pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Like I feel bad for people that get in that situation is because they're not protecting the community that they have. And here's what I know. When you're part of a community like here at Coastal, like when you fall down, you have somebody that's there to pick you up. In fact, I think it's one of the reasons these boys were able to do what they did because they knew that if they were standing, they weren't standing by themselves. Like Shadrach by himself, I guarantee he would have bowed. But he knew that Meshach and Abednego were right there and they locked arm in arm. And you need some people in your life that will lock arm in arm with you and say, listen, I'm not gonna let you bow. I'm gonna stand and together we're gonna stand and we're gonna overcome everything that this life throws our way. Listen, we need to make a decision. I'm gonna stand for my purpose. I'm gonna stand for my community. Number three, this is the most important one. When others bow, I'm gonna stand for my faith. And we've all had people in relationships that when they're looking at the world, they look at the wars, they look at the frustration, they look at the poverty, they look at the injustices that are out there. And it's really easy to come to the conclusion that like God is not good, God is, is unavailable, and that God doesn't care about us. And it's easy to have compassion in those moments. 
on those people, but at the same time, you gotta recognize like they must not be talking about the same God that I serve. Because, because here's what I know is that it, it, they're bowing down thinking God has left us, God has abandoned us, and God's not good. And it's in those moments that I'm gonna stand up because, because be very careful who you're talking about because while this world may be bad, God is always good. While we may be going through a storm, Jesus is right there with us in the middle of the storm. And I'm gonna stand for my faith even when it's a struggle, even when everybody else is dogging, even when everybody else is doubting, when there is no hope, I'm gonna stand up when everybody else is bowing and go, man, I'm gonna stand up for my faith and I think this is the call that God has given all of us to be Shadrachs Meshachs and Abednegoes even when the world bows we're going to stand for our faith Ephesians chapter 6 says this therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground when evil stuff comes in your life and listen it's not if it's gonna come into your life, it's gonna come into your life. It's not an if, it's a when. When you get the bad diagnosis, when that child goes a little bit crazy, when you're struggling with the addiction, he says you gotta be able to stand your ground. Let me have your attention, church. Look up at me. I think there's a lot of people in here today that the struggle has come, the day of evil has come, and you've just given in in life and said, I think that this is just how it's going to be. This is just what I'm going to deal with for the rest of my life. And, and, and you're beginning to bow down, and I'm here to challenge you and encourage you. It's time to stand back up. He says, stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Keep standing. Like when you've done it with all of your strength, and you're like, I don't really have any strength left. Since it's in those moments that you grab hold of the promise of God. And you go, God, I'm trusting that when I'm weak, you're going to be strong. God, I'm trusting in your truth. Even in spite of what my eyes see in this moment, because I'm going to stand for my faith while the rest of the world bows down. See, 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and lived a sinless life. And when life was difficult, when people were attacking him, when people were hurling all kinds of frustration at him, he could have very easily bowed in those moments. There's even a story where Jesus is tempted by Satan himself to, to bow down and Satan would give him everything and Jesus said, no, 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 you know what I'm gonna do? I'm not gonna bow down to you, I'm gonna stand. Firm. And in that moment where Jesus stood firm, they brought him to the cross. And they nailed it to it in front of everybody out there. And at the moment, he could have bowed down. He could have recanted his statement. But he chose to stood. He chose to stand firm. And the Bible gives us a cool glimpse after his death, burial, and resurrection as he ascended into heaven. In Colossians 3, 1, it says, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now, I think it's a really interesting posture that you see Jesus in after he's defeated death, hell, and the grave. He's sitting up in heaven next to the right hand of God like a victorious king. Like, I've already kicked the devil's butt. Like, I stood when everybody else bowed, and now I get to sit and see what happens. And then there's an interesting story in the book of Acts about a guy named Stephen, who's actually one of the disciples. And in Acts chapter 7, he's, he's preaching the gospel, and he ends up getting arrested, and he goes on trial. And as they're accusing him of crimes, he stands up and he begins to preach the gospel. And they're like, hey, you need to stop that. You need to recant those statements. You need to give up on this idea that Jesus was the savior of the world. And, and he refused. He, he stood up taller. He stood up stronger even more. And that infuriated the religious leaders of the day. So much so that they said, man, if you don't stop what you're saying to people, man, we're going to kill you. 
And he just continued to preach the gospel in that moment. They picked up rocks and they started hurling at him one after another, hitting him, beating him, bruising him. And every time he got hit, he would just step back up and continue in the faith going, man, I'm gonna trust in what I believe. And here's what it says. There's a little glimpse at the end of his life in Acts chapter seven. It says, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus was doing what? Jesus was standing? Wait a second, we just read in Colossians 3, 1 that, that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. But right here, it says that he's standing. And here's the truth that I wanna leave you today, church. When you make a decision like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you make a decision like Stephen, when everybody is against you, you decide to stand, here's what I've realized. When I stand, Jesus stands with me. And here's the good news for some of you today. Here's the encouragement for you. Some of you guys, you've been seated for way too long. It's time for you to stand up for your family. And listen, you're not standing by yourself. Jesus is standing with you. You need to stand up for your purpose. And when you stand up for your purpose, Jesus is standing with you. You need to stand up for your convictions. And when you stand up, Jesus is standing with you. When you stand up for your faith, you're not standing by yourself. Jesus is standing with you. When you stand up for God, you're not all alone. Jesus is standing with you. Come on. Let's give God some praise in here. It's time for some of you to get back up. You've been bowing for way too long. You've been bowing to all kinds of different things. And you think, well, man, it's going to take a lot of courage to get up. No, no, no. You have the ultimate source of encouragement. If you'll take a stand, Jesus We'll stand with you. Would you guys bow your heads and pray with me? God, I just pray right now over every person who's battling the frustration in life to stand. They're struggling to stand for their marriage. They're struggling to stand for that child that's wayward. They're struggling to stand in the midst of that addiction that has been hitting them over and over again. They're, They're struggling to stand for the miracle in their finances or the miracle in their health and god today i pray for renewed strength for every single one of them when the whole world bows god that they would stand right where you are just say god give me the strength to stand firm God, give me the strength to keep standing. I'm not going to give up on the hope. I'm not going to give up on the dream. I'm not going to give up on my purpose. God, give me the strength to keep standing. With every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe there's some people in here today that don't have a relationship with God. And I want you to know that while you may have bowed to the things of this world, you may have bowed low in your sin, that Christ came and died on a cross for you and for me. The Bible tells us that his sacrifice was a perfect sacrifice so that we would no longer have to go in low in life, that we could actually be raised up with Christ. And all we have to do is go to God and say, you know what, God, I'm tired of bowing to this world. I'm ready to surrender to something that can actually fill my life and change my life and transform my life. Something that is not in this world, but has defeated this world. And that's surrendering your life to Jesus. And maybe you're out there today and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. And I'm not talking about rules or religion or joining a church. I'm talking about there's a God that wants to know you intimately and personally. He wants to help you in the frustrations. He wants to help you in the struggles. He wants to help you in the situations where everybody is doing the thing and you know that there's something else you need to be doing to give you the strength to be able to stand and to change everything for everyone. And it begins with a simple yet significant prayer that you can pray right here today. If that's you with every head bowed and every eye closed, whether you're right here in Parkland watching online or in Lighthouse Point, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up in the air, and I'd love to pray a simple yet significant prayer with you for you to receive this free gift from God. One, two, three. Go ahead and slip those hands up. Slip them up high so I can see them. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I see you. Thank you. Yes, back there, three. Yes, four. Yes, five over there. Yes, six, seven. Anybody else? 
Everybody in Lighthouse Point, watch it online. You guys can put those hands down. You'll just pray this prayer in your heart as I pray it out loud. Say, God, thank you for loving me so much that in the middle of my battle, where I've constantly been bound low, you gave me a way to stand back up. That you loved me so much that you saw me in the middle of my mess that you would send your one and only son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to live a perfect life and die a sinner's death, the death that I deserve. God, I ask you to forgive me of my past, change my present, and secure my future. I surrender my will. I surrender my way. I'm no longer going to bow to the things of this world, but God, I choose to bow to you and surrender the entirety of my life, not just for eternity, but for today. Fill me with your love and your joy and your peace and your patience and your goodness and your mercy. Give me the strength to be able to stand all the days of my life. Thank you for loving me. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.